shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. God is keeping track of every lie. There is no escape. Proverbs 19.5 I will tell the truth for every lie Proverbs 19 5 A false witness shall not be unpunished and he that speaketh lies shall not escape A false witness shall not be unpunished and he that speaketh lies shall not escape Proverbs 19 5 Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Joggler 66 Hour of the Truth. As you can see in the title, I am to I'm to today together again with my brother in Christ, Tom Fress from Inquisition Update. Hour of the Inquisition Update meets Hour of the Truth, and we have come together to do uh, another reading of the book or the booklet, The Origin of Futurism and Preterism. As you already have watched two videos of this, this is now part three. Continuing in the book on page 10, after we have just read the quote from Henry Grafton Guinness's book, The Approaching End of the Age, last time. But before I continue now on the second paragraph on page 10, I, of course, first want Tom to introduce to you and uh, ask him how he is. Hello, Tom. Welcome to the broadcast. And Hello. You all right? Yes, fine. Um, uh, nice to be here and uh, uh, continue our reading and discussion of uh, the, the origin of futurism and preterism. Valuable information for God's people today, especially since futurism and preterism uh, are false schools of Bible interpretation. And uh, the correct school of, the, uh, of Bible interpret prophecy interpretation is historicism. It's the method of, of uh, interpretation held by all Christians prior to the early 19th century, and uh, we discover in this book that futurism and preterism have an agenda, and that agenda is to exonerate the papacy from the age-old accusation of Antichrist. And so that's why people in the world don't know who the Antichrist is today, and uh, they, th they say that the Antichrist is, is either an ancient figure of history that was long since done away with and destroyed prior to the 4th century. And uh, the other school of interpretation says the Antichrist won't come until the end of time, just before the fulfillment of uh, all Bible prophecy, but particularly the book of Revelation. It's all, it's all nonsense. And uh, both, both schools of interpretation have an obvious agenda, a common agenda, and that is to protect the real identity of the Antichrist, that is the papacy. So we're we're exposing the lies that have deceived the whole world. Back to you, Jörg. Well, Tom, these both schools have one thing in common. They are teachings of man. And the third possibility, which you call and which generally is called historicism, has another thing in common, uh, has another thing going on, and that has nothing to do with the teachings of man, but it's the teaching of God. I would, I would even yes. like to address to our listeners and viewers of the video um, that instead of historicism, call it a biblicalism. Call it the, what yeah. the Bible says. Call it what God says. Call it God's word, God's prophetic plan with this world from the beginning to the end. Because that's actually what it is. The reformers did nothing else but read and study the word of God that was not possible during the Dark Ages. They studied the word of God and from that they got the information that everything that has been fulfilled in history up to that moment and will be fulfilled in history in the future is written in the Bible, is written in the word of God. Therefore, historicism is nothing else than adhering to the Bible, sola scriptura, without any yeah. personal interpretation. Because 
when you, when we go deeper into the study and we see what Louis de Alcazar and um, Francisco Ribera did, was actually they twisted and they twisted the word of God, they left out something of the word of God, or they added to the word of God, just to make their stories fit. And the Bible says explicitly that you should not take away from the word, that you should not add to the word, or all the plagues of the world will come at you, right? That's correct. So wouldn't you agree that instead of actually calling it historicism, we should call it the biblical interpretation, God's interpretation? Well, certainly, yeah, certainly that's what it is. And when you study historicism, you realize it is, is it's teaching from the Bible and not the teachings of men. But it's generally recognized, uh, the term is generally recognized by those of that school of interpretation as historicism that the Bible records all of history, and, and it, there's no gap of 2,000 years or any such thing. So uh, we can argue about terms, <laughs> but... Uh, no, it was not to argue about but, terms, Tom, but it was to make I, wait, the point that actually we are just talking certainly. about Bible teaching. Let the Bible teach what us, let the Bible teach our viewers and our listeners... Let the Bible teach everyone, not you teaching, not me teaching, not Ribera teaching, and not uh, Alcazar teaching, yeah. but let the Bible teach us and let the Holy Spirit lead us through this reading of this book and analyzing and discussing of this, uh, of yeah. this work from, um, from these two authors, uh, Paul Owen and Charles Jennings, the origin of futurism and preterism. But let us remind our listeners here that actually we are dealing with what's written in the Bible and nothing else. No adding, no taking away. Yep. So historicism okay. is based on the Bible where futurism and preterism are based on the teachings of men. This is, I think, the very first important point that we should make. Well... They were men, no doubt, but they were first and foremost Jesuits, <laughs> and they were part of the Jesuit-led Counter-Reformation to destroy Protestantism and to restore the papacy to world supremacy, the same supremacy that the papacy enjoyed before the Protestant Reformation. So Alcazar and, and, and uh, uh, Ribera are Jesuits in charge of of destroying Protestantism. They developed two schools of Bible prophecy interpretation. One is called Preterism. Alcazar is the author of that, and Ribera is the author of Preterism, or ra rather Futurism. And Futurism and Preterism both protect the papacy from the own, exonerate the papacy. It's, it's, it's the answer, it's the Roman Catholic Church's answer to the Protestant Reformation. And let's not forget an important... The, the Protestant Reformation insisted that it was the papacy, was the Antichrist, the whole history of the papacy, and every pope in succession is the literal Antichrist of the Bible. That's what was believed by the majority of Christians all the way from the earliest centuries. As we've mentioned before, there's even record... In, in Henry Grattan book, uh, Henry Grattan Guinness's book, Romanism and the Reformation, where the earliest Christians prayed for the longevity of the Roman Caesars, so that the, it would so that God would delay the rise of the Antichrist. And sure enough, as soon as the Caesars were taken out of the way, that power which was restraining the rise of this man of sin, this son of perdition. As soon as they were taken out of the way, the papacy came to power. It is the papacy. It was the papacy. It always will be the papacy. That's the majority belief of Christians throughout history. Preterism is a new development. So is, so is futurism. And we're exposing the lies. This is all part of the Jesuit-led Counter-Reformation to, to destroy Protestantism, to destroy the King James Bible, and to bring the whole world into the grand delusion to, to prepare them to worship the papacy. And that's what the ecumenical movement is about. That's what Vatican II is about. 
is to create a global government, a global religion, a global economic system, all under the authority of the papacy. So we've discussed preterism, we've discussed futurism, and uh, we've discussed what Henry Grattan Guinness had to say about it. And now uh, Leroy Edwin Froome has things to say about it. Yeah, so he has. But I just yeah. wanted to add, because you mentioned Lacunza and you mentioned, um, uh, no, uh, Lacunza. Yeah, uh, Emmanuel Lacunza. Uh, Emmanuel Lacunza and uh, Francisco Ribera. We also should remind yeah. our listeners of the people that we mentioned last week, like Cardinal Bellamine, who was an absolutely yeah. devilish Jesuit in the, in the 1500s. And a little bit later, right. uh, we will meet, um, um, uh, um, what is this guy's name, who wrote The Coming of uh, Jesus Christ in Glory? Um, oh, that's Sir, uh, Sir Robert Newman, or Sir Robert, uh, Sir Robert Anderson. No, no, no. Um, no, no, no. Coming of Messiah in Glory, in glory and Majesty was a, a pseudo yeah, Jew. Yeah, exactly. It's actually he Jesuit was a Jesuit priest. Yeah. Yes, and uh, the name escapes me right at the top of oh, well, my yeah, head. Well, yeah, it's Lacunza I'll, I'll, because we were speaking about Alcazar and Ribera. It's Lacunza who wrote that. He, his pen name was Ben yeah. Ezra. Oh, yeah, he had his pen. His pen name was Ben Ezra. He pre, pre, he pretended uh, he was a Jesuit priest by the name of Lacunza. He was a Chilean Jesuit pretended priest, to be a Jew. and uh, pretending to be a Jew, knowing that a a, a book written by a Jew would find favor among Protestants, and especially if his book uh, was on the Roman Catholic uh, 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 list of forbidden uh, forbidden books. And so Lacunta's book, or Ben Ezra's book, was was listed on the uh, uh, the Vatican's uh, list of forbidden books. So it made it popular among Protestants. And that's how futurism first got its, uh, its first attempt to persuade Protestants that the Pope was not the Antichrist, that the Antichrist was a future single individual. And, uh, and, and so now we're off to the races. The Protestants have gotten wind of this, and then it becomes popular in the Protestant seminaries. And now it's popular behind all the Protestant uh, pulpits. And its whole aim from the get from the get go was to exonerate the papacy, and thereby cause the Protestants to repudiate their own Protestant Reformation, because the Protestant Reformation was based on the knowledge that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. Well, if Rome could sneak a book into the Protestant world that suggested that the Antichrist is not the papacy, was not the papacy, never will be the papacy but that the Antichrist is one single individual that comes to the, near the end of this dispensation, then the, then the Protestants have voluntarily, willfully, of their own volition, repudiated the entire Protestant Reformation, which demands that they return to the Roman Catholic Church. That's where we are today. That's what this is all about. This whole ecumenical movement... It began with this Chilean Jesuit, this writer, this man, Emmanuel Lacunta, writing under the Jewish uh, pen name of Ben Ezra, foisted upon the Protestant world the notion, the first time it's ever reckoned in the, in the Protestant world that the Antichrist was not the papacy, but one single individual that comes at the end of time. That's what futurism is. That's how it got its start. And this book records all these things that we're reading yeah. right here. And as you said, another accomplished author and church historian who has written extensively next to what we've uh, read in the last um, episode, just before the end, from Henry Gretton Guinness, uh, on, uh, on prophecy is Leroy Edwin Froome. And he wrote in four volumes that monumental work, The Prophetic Faith of Our Fathers. That is a book <clears throat> I um, found that yesterday. Uh, on the internet that you can download as PDF for free and can read for yourself. And he brings to light some startling bits of history. On the last paragraph on page 10 we read the following quote. As to futurism, for some three centuries this view was virtually confined to Romanists and was refuted by several masterly Protestant works. 
but early in the 19th century it sprang forth afresh, this time among Protestants. Samuel R. Maitland, William Burke, J. H. Todd, and more recently it has been adopted by most fundamentalists. In 1826 Maitland revived Ribera's futurist interpretation in England. The Plymouth Brethren, organized in 1830 by John Nelson Darby, where we also got a Bible from, at Dublin and Plymouth also laid hold on Maitland's interpretation. Now comes a sentence that I have to interrupt. I cannot read this in full and you will understand why in a moment. When the High Church Oxford movement between 1833 and 1845 gained ascendancy in Britain, here I have to make a little note. When I read that a few minutes ago, because I was reading a little bit in preparation of our study tonight, Tom, the year 1833 through 1845, it sprang just in my eyes. You know, I'm German. I'm very familiar with the German history between 1933 and 1945. Do you think there is a yes. <laughs> coincidence that exists that the High Church Oxford movement, which put the Catholics actually back in power in England, happened at the same time, 1833, 1845, when a hundred years later, Nazi Germany was the first country that absolutely put into working uh, the church's policy, as the Jesuits said? between 1933 and 1945? Can that be really a coincidence? Well, yes, no, it's no coincidence. Remember, we've even quoted the Jesuits as saying that, that uh, in their, in, in their, in their uh, counter-reformation efforts, that England was the main uh, theater of battle, and that once Protestantism was was destroyed or weakened in England, then Protestantism would fall all over the world. And 1833, 100 years before the Second World War, it records the, the, the ascendancy of the High Church Oxford movement, which was the, the, the branch of the Church of England, which became ritualistic. It, it maintained the mass. It maintained the priesthood of the Roman Catholic Church. It, it had, for all intents and purposes, it was Catholicism under the, it, it was Roman Catholicism couched in Protestant terms. There really wasn't a nickel's worth of difference between the high church of England as versus the, the low church, they called it, Got which was Protestant in its beliefs machine. and practices. But the high church of England uh, was, was more conforming to the, uh, the, the Roman Catholic model of worship. And, and uh, this was an attempt after uh, Roman Catholics were liberated in England and once again able to worship God according to the dictates of the Pope again. Then we see the Oxford movement. And this was literally the destruction of Protestantism in England. It got control of the Parliament. It got control of the Crown. And it got control of the, the, the power structure of England. And... Uh, and uh, that became the launching platform for World War II. That became the Vatican's incentive to, to, uh, to help the Nazi regime to destroy Protestantism in Germany. If it hadn't been for this 100-year advance attack on Protestantism in England, I dare say the Vatican wouldn't have been so influential in Germany. But this is, this is the... the, the, the the marching orders of the Jesuits destroy Protestantism in England, and after that, Protestantism will fall all over the world. So that's, I, I believe that's what you're seeing. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree also with your explanation there. I just found it so interesting that this is exactly 100 years before we have the so-called Third Reich in Germany, between 1933 yeah. and 1945, with the end of World War II, with whole Europe in ashes. I just thought that was interesting to go into a little bit deeper, as you did. 
Good, then I'm going to continue the reading now and everybody can make up his own mind what he thinks about this quote-unquote coincidence because there are no coincidences in that matter. When the High Church Oxford movement between 1833 and 1845, so continues the quote from the book The Prophetic Faith of Our Fathers, gained ascendancy in Britain, it rejected the Protestant historical school of interpretation and generally adopted futurism, though some among them swung to preterism. Bursting into full flame in 1833, it seized upon Maitland's interpretation and argument in favour of reunion with Rome. German rationalism, on the other hand, increasingly flaunted prophecy and prediction. Thus, the Jesuit schemes of counter-interpretation were more successful than their author had ever dared anticipate. Unquote. Okay, so the, Je the Jesuit schemes of counter-interpretation, that's just another expression for preterism and futurism, were more successful than the Jesuits ever imagined. And at the beginning of this quote, I want to bring your attention to something at the very beginning of this quote at, uh, on page 10. It says, as to futurism, for some three centuries, this view, Protestant, or rather, uh, uh, futurism, was virtually confined to Romanists, to Roman Catholics. Roman Catholics believed in futurism. Why? Because the Roman Catholic Church taught Roman Catholics about futurism to keep them from accusing, as they many, many times in the history of the Roman Catholic Church did before, accused the papacy of being the Antichrist. This was dissent within the Roman Catholic Church. This was ancient in the Roman Catholic Church. Those who had access to the Scriptures read the Scriptures the same way the Protestants did. The Antichrist is the papacy. So futurism, the idea that the Antichrist is not the papacy, but is one single individual that doesn't come uh, in the world until just before Christ's return, or preterism, that which describes the Antichrist as one of the pagan, the ancient pagan Roman Caesars, pre, uh, 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 what's his name, Nero or Caligula, or one of those were the Antichrist. So if you believe either one or both, then the papacy can't be the Antichrist. That's how Rome silenced dissent within the church. Now we're talking about the Protestant Reformation and how to destroy the Protestant Reformation. Well, if it worked in the Roman Catholic Church to silence dissent, maybe it will work in the Protestant world. And that's why he admits here that for some three centuries, this view, uh, pre uh, futurism, was virtually confined. In other words, you didn't hear about it outside the Roman Catholic Church. Okay? That's why it was brand new to the Protestants in the early 1800s. For the first time, it was it, in the Protestant world, the teaching of futurism and preterism literally got their start in the early 1800s. It's, it's, it's an abomination that overthrew the historical belief of, of Christians all throughout the centuries. For nearly 2,000 years, Christians believed it was the papacy. Okay? Literally, preterism and futurism are the new kids on the block. I think it is quite safe to say that that work that Francisco Rabira put out in 1590, with his uh, futurist interpretation of an antichrist, it was written in 1590, it was published in 1590, when, uh, because it was written between 1585 and 1590, and published 1590, 1591, and he died in 1591. Um, yeah. I think it is safe to say that the Jesuits did not publish that worldwide at that time, but kept it within the Roman Catholic Church to convince the laity, uh, not the laity, but the clergy, sorry, the clergy of the Roman Catholic Church well, of this futurism before it had to go out uh, and 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 then of course they can when they do this in the 18 in the 19th century and put that out they can say well this has existed for hundreds of years already to get more yes well my believable. my information my information says that what few protestants became aware of these early jesuit writings by ribera they answered in the negative 
They wrote about it. They wrote against this futurist mm -hmm. idea. But what we're talking about here is the introduction of this futurism into the mainstream Protestant seminaries. This is where Protestant or this is where uh, futurism got its first real uh, introduction into the Protestant yeah. world. When these books finally first came out in the, in the late 1500s by these Jesuit priests, uh, they were they were repudiated by what few Protestants heard of heard of them and had an, a, an opportunity to read those books. There was no there was no dissenting voice or there was no approval uh, among Protestants of this work. There was no approval by Protestants of Ribera's work. There was only argument against. And the Protestant argument is, there's no future Antichrist, there's only the historical and the present Antichrist, the papacy. And, he, and the Roman Catholic Church and the papacy will not be reformed because the Bible tells us it will only be destroyed when Christ returns. So, so uh, the early inklings of, of futurism and preterism were wrote about, uh, were wrote against by Protestants. But, the, but as, as ironic as it might seem, it became the widely accepted school of Bible of prophecy interpretation once these preterist and futurist lies were first taught in the Protestant seminaries. Yeah, I mean, you could maybe easily say that uh, Francisco Ribera was doing work ahead of his time. Uh, the yes. Jesuits uh, seemed it more fitting to start uh, teaching this with the starting of the Oxford movement after the liberation or the Emancipation yes. Act in England came through which gave uh, religious freedom back to the Roman Catholics so that they, as you already stated, yeah. uh, they could enjoy in their uh, superstitious and idolatrous religion again in England. And by that, yeah. of course, then starting with the Oxford movement, uh, taking over the Protestant seminaries, yeah. and then teach that yeah. what um, Ribera had written at the end of the 16th century. Because yeah. <clears throat> it was not necessary at the time when Ribera wrote that they had other... Uh, chickens to pluck <laughs> if you can say it that way they had other things to do on their agenda mm -hmm. until that time but in the beginning of the 19th century 1833 and so on the time was ripe and from that time they know they only need two or three generations to turn around the whole world to a different belief system yeah. and all they had to do was to get roman catholicism free to practice in england and they got that done, okay? Then it was allowable for the Jesuits and the Vatican to erect Roman Catholic seminaries and nunneries and, and, and monkeries, you know, yeah, monasteries. No. And, and, and then to uh, appoint Roman Catholics to high positions in the, in, in the parliament, which gave them even more power. And then, of course, you had the reestablishment of the Roman Catholic hierarchy, the ca the cardinals and, and the, the bishops, which literally, which literally forms the legislative body of the Roman yeah, Catholic the forming, Church. The, bishops the forming of, of all the dioceses. You spoke about that when you read uh, James Edgar yeah. Riley's Roman Civil Liberty extensively about that. So yes. that, for our listeners, is a work that they should uh, absolutely access on the archives on uh, First Amendment Radio on the playlist, your reading of that book. Because when you really want to get a deeper understanding of what we are just reading here in a few paragraphs... Uh, there have been whole books written about that, and James Edgar Wiley, a very renowned uh, Protestant writer from the 19th century, went into very deep lengths in studying that in his book uh, Rome and Civil Liberty that you read on First Amendment Radio, right? Yes. R what he describes is the dioceses of the Roman Catholic Church literally become political and religious jurisdictions. They're like... Uh, they're like the equivalent in the United States is you know, now, of course, they have Roman Catholic dioceses in the United States, too. But but they have the civil dioceses called the counties. And he, and over each county is a county seat, the county courthouse, the county attorney. And and all of that is just a mirror image of, of what Rome sets up with 
the establishment of her diocese. Mirror image. Interesting word. In, yeah. Interesting choice of words, and, and, Tom. A mirror image. Yeah. <laughs> when we when you think yeah. about Revelation, right? The image yeah. of the beast. And 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 the the bishops and the cardinals within these dioceses become the literal governing structure of Roman Catholics, and of course, their their jurisdiction also overlaps Protestants. Anybody within that jurisdiction is governed by this Roman Catholic hierarchy, and that's why James A. Wiley uh, uh, screamed at the top of his lungs, "Don't allow the Roman Catholic hierarchy back into this country." Don't allow them to uh, to divvy up the land into dioceses, because that's the governing structure of the Roman Catholic Church. I mean, he was... And as soon as these dioceses are established, then the bishops get together in conclave, at, at the, the 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 bishops' conferences, and they propose legislation for their diocese. And once these laws and rules and regulations of the dioceses are 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 published then they're sent off to Rome for ratification. Yeah, and when Rome ratifies them, then they become the law of the land. Now, if that's a Roman Catholic country, you might say that's legitimate. But if it's Protestant England, you would say it's a hostile overthrow of the, of the established Protestant government. And that's what it was. I think we are... And that's what happened. That's exactly what happened in the United States of America. I think too. in England we are speaking about John Henry Newman, right? He was, he was yes. the... Uh, diabolical cardinal who introduced uh, or who, who split up England in the, into the dioceses at that time, John Henry Newman. I yes. think uh, you you spoke extensively about him while reading that book from yep. Roman Civil Liberty. And what you just said, Tom, uh, actually is a summary of uh, of the video that Richard Bennett did and that you can find on my second YouTube channel: uh, yes. Vatican Control well, through Civil Law. Vatican control through civil law. That's correct. A video everybody should watch who is interested a little bit in this and sees that our reading here is not coming from nowhere, but is actually based on what we are talking the whole time about history. Yeah. People might ask themselves, who writes the mountains and mountains and mountains of legislation that goes through our Congress? <laughs> Georgetown, Who, Georgetown University, sure. they have a lot of writers. Well, the, let, let me <laughs> yeah, finish. The, 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 look, look, the congressmen don't have time to write this. They don't even have time to read it, Tom. They didn't read, they they didn't read the Patriot admit. Act when they passed it in 2001. <laughs> they admit they don't even have time yeah. to read them, let alone write them. So, where, so who writes the legislation? The bishops in the dioceses. When they meet for the bishops' conferences, for the bishops on conclaves, for each diocese, they propose legislation for their what diocese. What do you think they have all that monasteries for? Some the, the people that don't have anything to do but writing all the time. <laughs> then it goes off to a Jesuit university, and 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 eventually to the Vatican for ratic ratification, and then it comes back and it finds its way to the legislators' desks. And then they, they develop uh, people who support and promote the legislation. And then it's considered on the floor of the House of Representatives. Then it's considered on, on the floor of the Senate. And it's ratified. And, and, and then, truly, this is what happens. Roman Catholic canon law becomes the civil law of this land. You're going to find this absolutely absurd because nobody in the press talks about it, nobody in the mainstream media talks about it, and certainly nobody in the alternative media talks about it. But the civil laws of this land are ratified by the Pope. They are proposed. They are. They are. They are uh, originated by the bishops in the dioceses. It goes through the system, through the Jesuit universities, and the le the, the the canon lawyers of the Jesuits look at it and make refinements. It goes to the Vatican for ratification and signature of the Pope. It comes back, then it's introduced into the Congress and into the Senate, it becomes law, and then you and I, Protestant, Bible-believing Christians, are put under the power of the Pope through the civil laws. We become his subjects. And now we can understand why James A. Wiley was so livid when 
when they gave Roman Catholicism liberty in England and reestablished the Roman Catholic hierarchy and the breaking up of the land into Roman Catholic dioceses. Rome claims the divine right to rule every man, woman, and child on the planet. And if you give Rome the power to do it, she'll take it. And that's what they did in England. And that's what they did long ago in the United States of America. You are being, if you live in the United States of America, you are being forced to be and to conform to, to Roman Catholic. Without knowing it. Without, they'll never, they'll tell, never tell you. Tell you. No, because if they ever told us there might be another Protestant Reformation and we would, re we would repudiate fut futurism and go back to historicism and claim openly the papacy to be the Antichrist, close down all the Jesuit universities, close down all the Roman Catholic dioceses, kick the Catholics out of the Congress, kick the Catholics out of the Senate, kick the Catholics out of the White House, and make this a Protestant nation, and then go to war to stop this new world order. Do you know, Tom, I watched a video today from Bill Hughes that is called Donald Trump, Rome's Perfect Man. And... There is a quote in there that absolutely fits what we are talking about here right now. So please allow me that I will interrupt what you are saying for this in, uh, interesting quote that I traced down on the Internet. The uh, source is still to find. Uh, it is from charismanews.com, politics, elections, and so on and so on. The link I can provide in the description box of this video. Donald Trump, before his election, yeah, before his election, gave here, uh, 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 wrote a letter and made some points very clear. And I will just read to you the last sentences. I have a message for Catholics. I will be there for you. I will stand with you. I will fight for you, unquote. Donald Trump yep. wrote this letter to Catholic leaders before the election. Can you believe this? Can can you and grasp this, you what, what this means? Because when we go back into history, Tom, I think we don't do much reading of the book today, but this is really a history lesson to be told. When we go back to the 1960s, a, for the very first time, a Roman Catholic was to be president of the Protestant United States of America by the name of John F. Kennedy. Before his election, He went from Washington, where he lived, to Texas and to, a to, uh, to see different Protestant congregational leaders and to assure them that the Pope would not rule his politics. I mean, you can maybe put that later in a little better words than I'm doing right now. I'm just setting the tone for the next few minutes here. In the beginning of the 2000s, or at the end of, uh, of the 20th century, before the election of George W. Bush, the exact, op the exact opposite occurred. And George W. Bush came from Texas to Washington to assure to Catholic leaders in Washington that he would follow the policy of the Pope. And now we have this letter that is online, everybody can read it, a letter from the then president to be elected, Donald Trump, who says, I have a message for Catholics. I will fight for you. Yeah. Now, your thoughts on this? It's going to be broadcast like this before long are going to be labeled hate speech. They're going to take us off this the air. This is not hate speech. That is telling no. the truth. It is a verifiable source on the Internet. I have a problem with people yeah. who say fake news when this fake news is based on facts that everybody can research yeah. i'm not saying that trump wrote a lovely letter to santa claus i'm saying that he wrote an official letter to catholic leaders which is online to find i will be there for you i will fight for you of course tom i agree you are right because it's a question of interpretation yeah. but i don't care and i don't think you care because this truth has no. to get out and Until I take my last breath, I will nobody forbid me to speak the truth. Yeah. I spend at least three hours of every day 
trying to t warn the American people and the people of the world about what the Vatican's aims are. And, you have... and doing the, doing this book with you is is over and above what I do you every know, day. Your effort is really it's highly, that highly appreciated, to Tom. It's 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 very important to me. It's the most important message that one can utter today. So here we see, and and this is this is the point that I want to make. We have to see the um, the comparison. Or we have to compare what happened in England in the 19th century to what happened to the United States of America all through the last part of the 20th century and is still happening today. Right. And we have That's to right. see the things that are the same when, when, when we watch at what happened in England at the time, what is happening in America at this time, and what are the, how do you say that, um, uh, when something is the same. Um, <laughs> I, I, I just can't get similarities. Yeah, what are the similarities. Thank you. <laughs> Sometimes I just can't come to the easiest words. Uh -huh. That's my problem. I should have been born a native English speaker, but yeah, okay. <laughs> Too late for that. Um, but when 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 you see this, when 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 you see this, what what was uh, what was going on on the uh, at the time with uh, John F. Kennedy. And then, uh, before the, ele the first election of uh, George W. Bush with him, and then you see actually Donald Trump making a pledge, <coughs> I will fight for you, to Catholic leaders. Yeah. When you do not see any similarities there, dear listener, I cannot help you. But this video from uh, Donald Trump, Rome's perfect man, uh, Bill Hughes, is uh, uploaded from the YouTube channel um, Jesus is Going to Win, uh, a very nice YouTube channel. And of course, in that video, I have to tell you, there is here and there a little bit teaching of E.G. Uh, e. White, which I do not agree with, but I was watching that video for the historical facts. And uh, facts like this, yeah. what Donald Trump brought out here, is a reason to to watch this video of an hour uh, and and uh, from 40 minutes on uh, he goes into that so everybody can look that up and i will provide the link of that video in the description box uh, of this video do you have any remarks here to tom because i otherwise have another thing of the uh, of the quote that we just read when when you are done with your comment well i just would uh just tell the listeners, though, uh, I disagree with some of uh, Bill Hughes's uh, theology. Uh, I credit Bill Hughes for being one of the preeminent researchers uh, because Bill Hughes understands the Jesuit-led counter-reformation. He understands the Vatican has control of politics. And whenever, whenever Bill Hughes sets out to research a political candidate for president of the United States, he knows exactly where to look. And he found a link between Donald Trump and the Roman Catholic Church. And I found one myself as well, <clears throat> doing my own research, came across a video of the Al Smith Memorial Dinner of, of just prior to the elections. And for, for those who don't know, the first outwardly confessed Roman Catholic, professing Roman Catholic that ran for president, his name was Al Smith, and I can't remember the year, but uh, it was the first attempt of the Vatican to get a, a, a card-carrying Roman Catholic to, to occupy the White House. He failed. He didn't, he didn't win the presidency. But ever since then, Rome has inaugurated that Roman Catholic's run for president by honoring his name every year called the Al Smith Memorial Dinner. And that's when the Roman Catholic hierarchy gathers both political candidates for president, Democratic and Republican, and they hold a, a charity, a, a fundraiser for Roman Catholic charities, and allow the two candidates to confront one another in a debate or in a roast, as it were. And uh, Rome, literally, the, 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 the high priest of what do you call the cardinal of the, uh, arch, the main archdiocese in New York City, sits right between the Edward two candidates. Egan. Edward Egan was the one at the time. Now it's, uh, I can't even uh, tell you who Dolan it is now. Not. He's, I think. Now Timothy Dolan's been replaced too, I think now. 
But nonetheless, they picked the, the, the main hierarch of the Roman Catholic Church in the United States yeah, to the Archbishop to of New York officiate the, the so-called the Archbishop of the New same York, office yes. that Cardinal Spellman had uh, in the 60s when we called uh, the Vietnam yes. War Spellman's War. Uh, he is actually in the seat that is uh, the Pope of America, if you uh, if you want to say it like that. He's yeah. he's the American yeah. Pope. Yeah, I, I think it is Cardinal Edward Eaton and, for the moment. And it was well, if you want to talk about it, I mean, if you want to give him all the offices that he hold, he's a, he's ahead of the Knight of Malta. Generally speaking, the Archbishop of, of the Diocese of New York is the head of the Knights of Malta. He's also, uh, or the heads of the Knights of Columbus in I the United States. And he's also the military vicar of the United States of America. He, he, When he comes to power, he becomes the military vicar of the United States of America. Without fanfare, he becomes the spiritual and the temporal ruler of the United States military. Just any, anybody wants to can go to Google and look up uh, military vicar of the United States of America, and you'll find the Archbishop of New York. Mm -hmm. And so that's the, their open declaration, the Al Smith Memorial Dinner, and the titles that the Archbishop of New York holds uh, is an outward, an outward show of the Vatican's control of our government and its military. And so this is what happens when, uh, when you forget... When you forget through Jesuit deception, either preterism or futurism, this is what you forget. When you, when you forget the Pope is the Antichrist. When you repudiate by your actions in believing in futurism or preterism, you exonerate the papacy, and the papacy automatically takes his self-proclaimed role as the god of this world. And the king of kings and the lord of lords. And because preterism and futurism were so widely believed among Protestants in this country, it's no longer a Protestant country, it's a Catholic country. And Rome steps right in and takes control. And this, these are visible, outward, publicized displays of Rome's power in Washington, D.C. I've told you how they produce the, the civil laws of this land. This is a Catholic country. When they call it a Christian country, it, dis, it, it obscures from you what they're really saying. In the Roman Catholic world, Christianity is only Roman Catholic. So when, when the Archdiocese of, of, the, of New York claims the United States is a, is a Christian country, he's telling you it's a Roman Catholic country. Protestantism committed suicide, in their view, when they believed in futurism and preterism. They, 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 they just laid down and died. Because the whole Protestant Reformation was based on the notion, the belief, the assertion, the positive assertion that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist of the Bible. It's irreformable. God put it here to test his people, and he has existed ever since the Caesars fell in Rome. He has become the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. All the Bible prophecies in the book of Revelation up, till the, up until the sixth trumpet have been fulfilled in our Christian era. The Antichrist has deceived the whole world. The Antichrist has slain the saints of Almighty God, is drunk with the saints of the martyrs of Jesus, and it's all, it's all taken place during the entire Christian era. There's no 2,000-year gap. God did not go to sleep. Pro Bible prophecy has been being fulfilled all throughout the Christian era. Christ in the body of Christ and Antichrist and Roman Catholicism exist together, and, the, and God is making the separation between the two. History is a record of the fulfillment of Bible prophecy and revelation. That's, that's, that's the historicist view. It's the only correct view. It's the only one that makes sense. Futurism and preterism are ridiculous in comparison. That's the truth. The sad truth. Yes. This is what you have. This is what happens when any nation forgets who the Antichrist is. Yeah. When any nation forgets their Protestantism, Rome takes over. And that's what's happened in this country. That's what's happened in Europe. And uh, the world is her oyster now. Okay, and, and voices like ours in protest against the Antichrist of Rome, 
it's going to be considered hate speech. We're going to be taken off the air, and we're going to be personally persecuted for what we say. This is what happens in a Roman Catholic country. You shall not utter a word against the priest or against the pope. That's what Donald Trump said. I will defend you. Catholics, I am with you Catholics, meaning I am against you Protestants. Okay? Donald Trump is going to fight for the Catholics of this country and the ecumenical evangelical bellies that are going back to the Roman Catholic Church who have believed in futurism and preterism and are now going back to the Church of Rome. Oh, they're keeping their Protestant names, Baptist, Lutheran, Presbyterian, on and on, but they're Roman Catholic in their belief, and they put themselves subjectively under the papacy's rule and reign. And they are on the side of Donald Trump. So God is separating the wheat from the chaff. God is drawing the, the battle lines and making it obvious who are his servants and who aren't. So every, every listener has to decide for himself what side they're going to be on. Are they going to be on the side of Christ and the truth and the King James Bible and the Protestant Reformation and historical interpretation of Bible prophecy? Or are they going to be on the futurist or the preterist or the papal system of Bible and prop, uh, antichrist prophecy? That's the battle line in the United States of America. And the, and the scales are largely in favor of the papacy. God is showing that the tares fully outnumber the wheat in this country. <clears throat> and I assume the same for Europe. Everybody's going back to Rome. The governments of the world have kowtowed to Rome. The Pope is once again the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It would never have happened had it not been for futurism and preterism. Had it been for historicism, the Protestant view of the papacy, there would have been resistance to papal power in this country. But there's not any resistance to papal power in this country. So we find ourselves in an extreme minority. And there's very little incentive for Washington or Donald Trump or Congress or the Senate or even your local county government to allow freedom of speech when it comes to discussion about the Pope being the Antichrist. We are vastly outnumbered. We're losing our rights by the day. And the American people seem satisfied with it, too. The rights and liberties that we enjoy in this country came about because of the Protestant Reformation. They viewed papal tyranny just as it's, they called it, papal tyranny. And they wanted liberty to worship God according to the dictates of their hearts and according to the leading and teaching of the Holy Spirit and the written word of God. That's where we get our liberties. Take away Protestantism, take away the historicist interpretation of Bible prophecy, what you get is papal tyranny. Take away the history. And that's take what we have. Take away the history of your country, Tom. Excuse me, right. but the continent of America was quote-unquote discovered, and you and I, we both know that it was not discovered, but that's another story for another day. Yeah, God <laughs> discovered it when he created it. Uh, even, even the people who quote-unquote discovered it already knew it was there, but that's another point. But it was quote-unquote discovered in 1492. And then there is a big part of American history that nobody knows anymore. Because the next thing that you are told in schools is the founding of your nation in, through the... Um, uh, uh, yesterday I already couldn't come to that name of that war. The War of Independence and the Declaration yeah. of Independence in 1776. Between 1492 and 1776 there is a big blank. 
in your history because you are not told this. What you are not told, my dear American brethren, is that everyone who came over to your country came out of prosecuted Europe, prosecuted by the man of sin, the son of perdition, the little horn, the Antichrist. And that's why it was not allowed for Catholics to hold office or to even hold their mass in the time of the 13 Protestant colonies. And then you had the founding of the nation state of United States of America with re freedom of religion and that opened the door yeah. for the Catholics to come in. And from that moment on, America actually went on the downward path. But isn't it, isn't it interesting, Tom, that when you think about it, who has ever told you about history? What do you know, Tom, personally, from school? I mean, not what did you, what did you not teach yourself? What did you learn by, by going into history stuff and all that stuff? What, did you been, what have you been teaching in school about the time of America between 1492 and 1776? The trials and tribulations of the early, earliest days of this of this country are the historical record of Rome's struggle to get control of this country. It began a Protestant country. Twelve of the thirteen colonies were avowedly Protestant. They viewed every Roman Catholic as an Antichrist, who worshipped the Antichrist in Rome. They were forbidden to hold public office. They were forbidden to vote. They were forbidden to hold Roman Catholic ceremonies and masses. The priests were considered vile. And uh, Roman Catholicism could not practice in this country. And yet there was one colony, Maryland, where religious liberty was championed. Well, religious liberty for whom? Roman Catholicism. They demanded Rome have liberty in Maryland to practice Roman Catholicism. And that's where we get Washington, D.C. It was separated out of Maryland, and it became the, the, uh, the federal government of the United States of America. And Rome has claimed credit for Washington, D.C. ever since. Of course, Rome was also called in the 1663 uh, land uh, records Rome, and the river Potomac was called the Tiber. But that's not the point. A that's a that's not the point, Tom. I, I, I love the way that you explained it. Absolutely right. And, and there's nothing that I want to go even deeper in, into more anymore. But the point that I wanted to make is just, are the children in American schools today or at your time when you went to school, which is a few years ago, taught anything about the history of the 13 colonies? Taught anything? No, not in religious you terms. You see, and that's, not in and religious that's my terms. point. That's my point, because by omitting teaching you this history, the Roman Catholic Church has an easy way. By omitting this and this brings me to because when, when I read this paragraph you went to the begin sentence and wanted to talk a little bit about that as to futurism for some three centuries this view was virtually confined to Romanists was your point my point is with the last but one sentence German rationalism on the other hand increasingly flouted prophecy and prediction uh, and prediction what does that mean we have in this world Tom Two countries who stand for the Reformation. That is England, where we have the morning star of the Reformation from, John Wycliffe, where people like Tyndale came out, and so important authors that we are speaking about here, where this quote comes from, Leroy Edwin Froome, Henry Gretton Guinness, James Edgar Wiley, people that we just mentioned. That is one part of Protestantism, England. And the other cradle of Protestantism is Germany, where in 1517 Martin Luther 
nailed his 95 Theses against the Roman Catholic Church on the church door in Wittenberg. And then later on, in 1520-21, with his translation to the Bible into the Vulgar language, into the common language of the people, because that's what Vulgar means, people, it's not a dirty word, it just means for the common people, when he translated the Bible and by the invention of the book press of Gutenberg 160-70 years before that in the midst of the 15th century, the Bibles were spread all over Europe and that knowledge that people could gain from reading the word of God for themselves the very first time gave them all the knowledge that we are talking here all the time about, namely that the Pope is the Antichrist. So we have two yep. important cradles of Protestantism in Europe. We have England on the one hand and Germany on the other hand. And then it says here in this little paragraph that I just read, re German rationalism, on the other hand, increasingly flouted prophecy and prediction. With other in other words, because of Germans were influenced by their philosophers and their psychologists like Hegel and Freud and Schopenhauer and... Uh, Nietzsche and all these guys, Germany was not interested in Bible prophecy and prediction. Germany was as put to sleep as was England. And that's why I think that this paragraph, this little sentence also is very interesting because it actually deals with the two flames of Protestantism in Protestant Europe. England on the one hand and Germany on the other. And in Germany, they, it seems, did not have to do very hard work. Right, Tom? How do you see that? Well, I'm not as familiar with European history as you are, but I well, I well know that if you, if you were to establish a birthplace of Protestantism in the world, it would have to be Germany with Martin Luther. And you know the Vatican never forgets a, 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 a wrong and, and, and the Vatican has tried over and over and over to punish Germany for what it allowed to, to occur in Germany, the Protestant Reformation, to overthrow the papal power in Europe. And uh, Rome seeks vengeance continually for, for Germany's uh, part in leading Europe against the papacy. And... Uh, Look, the same could be said of the United States. I mean, we could take up all day talking about these things. What was necessary for the United States was that Romanism get the upper hand. And Rome literally fomented the Revolutionary War to get the colonies separated from Protestant Great Britain, get the colonies separated from the Church of England to give Romanism freedom to then gradually, ever since, ever since that time, to gain the upper hand in America. I think you could not even put that in lesser two sentences and say it that, uh, uh, that well that you just expressed that, Tom. Now, not only that, but they needed the help of the Civil War to accomplish this. What they needed was a Civil War to uh, 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 get the United States, which was predominantly Protestant, to fight in common effort. Uh, in other words, to, the Vatican strategy was, first of all, to, to divide and conquer. That's what they accomplished for the, uh, in the Civil War, to divide the nation with the Vatican siding with the uh, with uh, the South and the the the, uh, the Southern president, uh, what was his name? Uh, Jackson. No, no, no. The president of the South. Uh, Jefferson. Uh, no. Um, oh, his name will come to me. And then and then to force the United States to make capitulation to the Vatican to make the nation so destitute for funds to finance this expensive war that they had to rely on Roman Catholic nations to finance it. Well, who, who benefited from all this? What we got out of the Civil War were the 13th, 14th Amendments that made us all slaves to the federal government. 
it was, uh, you know, there's a, a wrestling strategy that if you wish to throw your opponent backwards over your head, the first thing you need to do is push your opponent and get him to, to push back. And then without him expecting it, grab him and his momentum pushing toward you and then throw him over your head. That's what the Civil War Jefferson was. Jefferson Davis was his name. And the Vatican, that. Jefferson Davis, yes. The president of the South was Jefferson Davis. And the Pope at the time, I believe, is uh, was Pope Pius yeah, IX. Pope Pius IX. Uh, uh, sided, sided with the South. It was an effort to bring division in the country and, and so that the, the Vatican would ultimately gain the throwing of all political power and the rights of the states being put upon the federal government. Rome knows this strategy from thousands of years of practice. Look, farmers know this too. If you want to control the horse, you have to control the horse's head. So you fashion a bridle, don't you? Put it on his head. Then you can fasten your your leash to the bridle. And then if you want to be able to steer the horse while you're riding, you put a bit in his mouth. Okay, if you want to control the whole horse, you have to control the head. The whole Civil War was in an effort to consolidate power in Washington, D.C. It's much easier for the Pope to control the whole nation if it gets control of the federal government. First of all, to minimize the sovereignty of the states and to make them a conglomerate of a federal union. Then all Rome has to do is to use her minions and her priests and her legislators to get control of Washington, D.C. Then they can make the whole country Catholic. That's exactly what the real purpose of the Civil War was, to get the nation started on a footing of debt and to suspend the Constitution and to put in a papal government. Now, it has taken up till now to gradually get control of this country. And some Protestants like myself are fighting back. That's what Inquisition uh, Inquisition Update is all about, is fighting back Rome's pretended power in Washington, D.C. And the President of the United States is answering people like me. I will defend the Roman Catholic Church. That's what he says. I will be there for you. I will stand with you. I will will fight for you. Yeah. The, so it's always been the United States. If, if, if you if you understand anything from this discussion is is finally grasping the historical context that uh, that the Roman Catholic Church has struggled for control of the, Rome, uh, of the United States ever since the beginning. And what we've come to now is full fruition. Vatican Council II was nothing less than a surrender of the Protestants. I mean, they had to confess if they no longer believe the papacy is the Antichrist, then the papacy must be the vicar of Christ on earth. And Vatican Council II was literally Rome's declaration of victory over Protestantism. And now Protestants are under a mandate, come back to Rome or else. And together with the ecumenical evangelibellies, those have already gone back to the Roman Catholic Church, even though they preserve their Protestant name. Together, the Roman Catholic Church and the ecumenical evangelibelli churches now form a religious political colossus in this country that cannot be challenged. And that's why Donald Trump can stand up boldly and publicly say he's going to defend and fight for the Roman Catholic Church. They've already won the victory. And Rome has already convinced the president, presidential candidates, both left and right, no matter who you vote for, they have to be for the Roman Catholic Church. They have to defend the Roman Catholic Church or they, they can't get elected. And uh, the same goes for the local state legislatures. Rome's power is has canvassed this whole country right up to your local county government, right up to your local school board and your local munis- municipality. And none of this religious background is ever talked about. But all the conflict in this country is based on a religious or Roman Catholic agenda. Isn't that what they say, Tom? There are two things you never speak about, religion and politics. 
Religion speak and about politics. Football, and why speak do they all sex? Speak about gaming. Speak about LGBT or whatever movement. But do not speak about yeah. politics or do not speak about religion. Why? Because if there's too much talk about religion and politics, the American people, by the spirit of God, might conclude that there is a religious and political colossus in this country that controls every aspect of our being. Too much talk about religion and politics will wind up somebody finally concluding that religion and politics are now one and united and inseparable. And that it's not politics that we're really fighting. It's the Roman Catholic Church we're fighting. It's the woman that rides the beast. It's the woman the that church. rides the beast. That, that description in Revelation chapter 17 is description of the woman, which is the Roman Catholic Church, and the beast beneath her is the governments of the world that carries her about wherever she wants to go. That's how the historicists interpreted that prophecy, and they were absolutely correct. Now, you take either preterism or futurism, that vision in Revelation chapter 17 makes no sense. You, you, you can come up with uh, any number of different interpretations about it, but no correct ones. But if you understand that that woman represents the Roman Catholic Church the whore, the harlot, decked in scarlet and purple, the color of the bishops and the priests, with a golden cup in her hand. That's the Roman Catholic Mass. And then the beast that carries her are the governments of the world. Then everything that happens in this country all of a sudden makes perfect sense. And the Protestants, the historicists throughout history, understood that prophecy understood that vision people today think they are so smart they think they are so smart and they don't know the first thing about smart ever learning and never come to the Fu knowledge right futurism in comparison to historicism is a laughing stock a laughing stock Surely is, Tom. And Absolutely. when we continue in this book, um, the second paragraph on page 11, just to see if we can finish a page within an hour and a half, <laughs> 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 I'm going to continue reading. There is um, a person called Tenor, which in a footnote we can read. It's Joseph Tenor, who is the author of the book Daniel and the Revelation that was written in 1898 on page 17 and that was quoted in Leroy F. Froome's work The Prophetic Faith of Our Fathers as we were quoting from before. This tenor expresses the tragedy and I think Tom will go into an extensive comment after this little paragraph. <laughs> tenor expresses the tragedy of modern Protestantism thus playing into the hands of Romanism. Quote, it is a matter for deep regret that those who hold and advocate the futurist system at the present day, Protestants as they are for the most part, are thus really playing into the hands of Rome and helping to screen the papacy from detection as the Antichrist. It has been well said that, quote, Futurism tends to obliterate the brand put by the Holy Spirit upon popery, unquote. More especially is this to be deplored at a time when the papal antichrist seems to be making an expiring effort to regain his former hold on men's minds. End quote from Tenor. Well, the only, the only thing I have to say about it is I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> Yeah, the last half hour we were speaking about what he actually writes in this little paragraph, so a further discussion yep. of this would be redundant and just time-consuming. So I'm going to continue on the last paragraph on page 11. Thus Guinness and others have opened the pages of history to reveal the origins of futurist thinking. However, 
Romanism did not consider the futurist interpretation of prophecy sufficient to lay all questions and objections to rest. There had to be another school of interpretation to answer those objects while simultaneously removing the papacy from the reformers' glare. The papal origins of preterism. Because, to be fair, this first part of the book actually deals most of the time with preterism and all we have been talking about for 90% of the time is futurism because that is the most accepted school today worldwide and therefore it absolutely needs to be addressed but we should not forget that now we can learn a little bit about the papal origins of preterism and there are probably a lot of viewers who don't even know what preterism actually completely is even though that Tom addressed that extensively in this and other broadcasts but we will now go into this little booklet the origin of futurism and preterism and we'll see what are the papal origins of preterism to lay further questions, the author continues on the top of page, in, uh, of page 12, to lay further questions and objections to rest, another school of interpretation was developed. So just how and when did the Preterist school of prophetic interpretation begin? Dr. Henry Gretton Guinness, in his book, The Approaching End of the Ages, answers that thought-provoking question with this observation. Quote from his book. The first, or preterist, scheme considers these prophecies to have been fulfilled in the downfall of the Jewish nation and the old Roman Empire, limiting their range thus to the first six centuries of the Christian era and making Nero Antichrist. This scheme originated with the Jesuit Alcazar toward the end of the 16th century. It has been held and taught under various modifications by Grotius, Hammond, Bossuet, Eichhorn and other German commentators, Moses Stewart and Dr. Davidson. It has few supporters now. It has few supporters now, says Henry Gretton Guinness at the end of the 19th century, and need not be described more at length. Unquote. Notice that Dr. Guinness mentions that preterism had few supporters in 1887. However, today, and this book was published 2006, it is enjoying resurgence and is the view held by many of the reformed faith. When you hold preterism as your faith, what are you reformed to, I ask myself. You have an, uh, a remark there, Tom? Well, I would only... I would only say that to protect and to exonerate the papacy from the age-old claim that the Pope is the Antichrist, Rome simply put out two alternatives, preterism and futurism. Whichever one came first, I won't quibble with, but it left it open for the Protestants that once believed in either preterism or futurism, that if their, their, their predicted fulfillment of prophecy doesn't occur just as they predict, according to their either their futurist beliefs or their preterist beliefs, then they can swap sides. And the futurist can, can become preterist, and the preterist can become futurist, so long as nobody returns to historicism. As long as you don't believe the truth, I don't care which lie you follow. That's right. You know, preterism was insufficient to answer all the questions. So there had to be fr uh, futurism. It, right there is the admission that neither is correct. Yeah, we're going to read in the next page a very in uh, interesting sentence in that regard. So, <laughs> Yes, go ahead. Those of the preterist school of interpretation should take special note of Dr. Guinness's statement taken from page 113 of his wonderful book, Romanism and the Reformation, of which we quoted uh, already extensively in the, last, uh, in the second broadcast of this reading. Quote, Some writers asserted that the predictions pointed back to Nero. This did not take into account the obvious fact that the Antichrist power predicted was to succeed the fall of the Caesars and develop among the Gothic nations. 
end quote. Okay, where did this he get is, this? Where did this he get this? This is so important because this goes back to our very first broadcast, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 7. Exactly. exactly. He who what now letteth from the word of God verbatim. He who now letteth will yes. be taken out of the way. Until he be, uh, un, until he who now letteth will be taken out of the way, the Antichrist does not come. And he who now yeah. letteth is the Roman Caesars. Yes. And that's why this is so important to understand. This, Dr. Gretton Guinness says, did not take into account the obvious fact. Why is it obvious? Because we have the word of God. We can read 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 7. And we can understand that when that was written, there was only one power in the world. And that was the Roman That's Caesars. Right. He who now let us the emphasis, and this is the point that I want to make, Tom, and you can directly go in there and, and sustain me in. The point is that he who now let us is important, not he who let us. Because that is the mistake that was also taken, uh, made in the other book, but I don't go back there now. The emphasis must be on he who now let us and not on he who let us. Because when we say that he who let us, you have then the false interpretation from the corrupted Bibles like the NIV that the he is equivoted, uh, uh, quoted to the Holy Spirit. But it is that he who now let us, that is the important stuff. And that are the Roman Caesars at that moment. And that is the point that has to be addressed. Yep, the positive identification of the papacy being the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the little horn of Daniel, is all given to us. If we will receive it, it's given to us in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 7. Paul was speaking 2,000 years ago to the Thessalonians, and when he was with them in person, he told them perfectly who this Antichrist would be. And he talked about who was restraining that Antichrist power from coming to fruition. What was withholding the rise of the Antichrist? It was the power then currently now reigning, the Caesars. And once the Roman Caesars were taken out of the way, then that man of sin would be revealed. This is the historical belief of all Bible-believing Christians for 2,000 years. First, the first step in identifying from Scripture precisely, perfectly who the Antichrist is, positively who the Antichrist is, is to first positively, perfectly identify who restrained him from coming to power. And once you know who that restrainer is and that he would be taken out of the way, then you positively know who the Antichrist is. And history leaves no alternatives. When the Caesars of the ancient Roman Empire, when the, when the ancient Roman Empire fell, what grew, what grew up in its place is indisputable the Holy Roman Empire under the popes. Daniel's little horn. Nobody, nobody with two neurons to rub together could come to a different conclusion. If you know who was in power when Paul was speaking, he said, he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. That was the Roman power. That was the Caesars of Rome. And when he comes, when he is taken out of the way, then that man of sin shall be revealed. This is the historic believing, the, the historic belief of all true Bible-believing Christians for 2,000 years. This is where we get our unequivocal stand against the papacy. Now, it's only compounded from there. I gave you one, the vision of Revelation chapter 17. And, and so many other passages in the New Testament and in the Old, they are making reference directly to the papacy. The papacy had his likeness even during the Old Testament times. And all the like Pharaoh are given as our example. And in each one, we see the papacy 
aspects of the papacy. Pharaoh, Nimrod, Nebuchadnezzar. Yes. Haman. You name it. They all demonstrated characteristics Antichrist. that we find all that we find all together and simultaneously in the papacy. If there if 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 Paul alone isn't enough, there's a whole Bible of evidence backing up the assertion that the papacy is the Antichrist of the end times. But Paul makes it unequivocal. He who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And when he's taken out of the way, then that man of sin will be revealed. There is no chance to get this wrong. And all God-fearing, Bible-believing Christians prior to the 18th, 19th century got it right. And everyone who died, whose blood was spilled on the ground for what they believed, their blood was spilled because they insisted that the papacy is the man of sin, the son of perdition. They died accusing the Pope of being the Antichrist. They died knowing who the Antichrist was. Sure, they believed Jesus was the Christ. Absolutely, that's the foundation of our faith. He's the rock and foundation of the church. But the Antichrist is just as important to identify as is Christ. Because if we can't identify him, then he can deceive the whole world. And we've allowed it to happen by believing in futurism, by believing in preterism. We have ex we have exonerated the papacy from the age-old, perfect description: Antichrist, man of sin, son of perdition, he who deceives the whole world, the self-styled vicar of Christ, the one who is guilty of the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus. History leaves us no alternative but the papacy. Any alternative other than the papacy is fantasy, carefully devised fables, meant and created to deceive God's very elect, and it has. Preterism and futurism have deluded the whole so-called Christian world. And we have to abandon these false beliefs and return to the historical term, interpretation of Bible prophecy and the correct understanding of history. I'm sorry. I, if you can't see the passion. Oh, I can see and I can hear it, Tom. And, um... Listen, it, it, listen it, it's often interpreted by people as anger. But listen, am I not justified in seeing what Satan has done to God's house, to see what the man of sin has done to God's true elect. How, how can anyone speak about these things in just normal conversational tones? The consequences of our deception are incalculable. How many souls will be lost by returning to the Roman Catholic Church, the synagogue of Satan? How many souls will be lost who bend the knee to Baal, who bend the knee to the papacy, the modern-day Pharaoh? Listen, we have our Moses. It was the Protestant reformers. They delivered us out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, under Pharaoh in Rome. But now so many of us want to go back. This happened to Moses, and what happened to them? The earth opened up and swallowed them. Those who championed the desire to go back to Egypt under the, 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 the Pharaoh's slavery, the ground literally opened up and swallowed them. That's what's going to happen to these who have joined the ecumenical movement who have forgotten the historical interpretation of Bible prophecy. Because you have to forget historicism to even dabble with futurism. It's, 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 uh, it's beyond my ability to communicate 
the seriousness of this of this situation. I just words fail me. I hope that uh, people understand the main motivation why we are doing that, Tom, because it is because we love our brethren, because we love people, we love the Jews, we love the Roman Catholics, we love the Hindus, we love the Islamic people, because they are all betrayed. They all follow a lie. Yeah. The people are wonderful people, but they're belief system that dogmas they are following are a lie yep. but the people is what we want to reach and that is what we are going to reach here and there a little yeah i hope at least because that's yeah. i think why i was called to do this and you too tom the same this is our motivation why we are doing this and uh, I want to bring this broadcast here after an hour uh, an hour and a half to a, to an end that we can take a little break uh, 